this is a all-time get for me. I've been talking about this guy for probably eight years, I think, maybe nine years. Uh, I'm a huge fan of him. I discovered he has some, you're going to look, I maybe get a little emotional at the beginning, but um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it doesn't turn you off. Uh, this is a guy that kind of changed the way I did my business. I, I'll, I have so much that I say in the podcast about this that I don't want to say it twice, but I found this guy and he was vlogging and it was interesting to me and it seemed like something fun and just getting into the equipment and following him really gave me like a rebirth to passion about this business for me. It was at a time where I was just down and out and I found this guy and uh, and it changed my career. This one dude, Casey Neistat, on my podcast today changed the trajectory of my career where I could just take it and do it on my own. And I've wanted to get him on my podcast for a very long time. Luckily, he lives in L.A. now. Well, for the time being, he lives in L.A. And so I was very lucky to have an opportunity to sit down with him. And we did it indoors. Uh, it is very minimal. None of the artwork that's up for the new pot. This is before. This is the first indoor one we did. All we have is this Burt Cast sign. I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed talking to Casey Neistat. If you don't know, Casey Neistat is a YouTube personality, a vlogger, a filmmaker with his brother Vans. He's an all around awesome dude that I've been following online for a really long time. You're going to love this podcast. It's one of my favorite conversations I've had in a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, Casey Neistat. This is our first official indoor Burt cast at the new studio. It's not set up. This is it's raining outside. We've been doing them outside. Casey, before I let you talk, and before I, I welcome you to the podcast, I have to explain what a tremendous effect you have had on my career. Um, I'm going to get emotional on this. Uh, I You'll never know how you affect people. Um. It was like 2015, and I was doing Travel Channel. I, was worked, I used to work for Travel Channel for like uh, nine years, and I just was lost. I didn't know what I was doing. I was I was a host, and I wasn't really focusing on stand-up, but I was doing the road, and I was in Philadelphia, and I was in my hotel room. I got a GoPro, and and uh, Mr. Ben Brown, I think you know who that yeah. is. Uh, I, his video, a video of his came up, him and his girlfriend waking up in a camper in South Africa, and it was just beautiful, and it just caught me. And I went, who is this guy? Wait, what is this? He's got like, what, like 45,000, 145,000 views. What, what does this guy do? And, and I would, I was already like not big on YouTube, but like I was, I was on Rogan's podcast and we were all YouTubers. I, I guess I didn't know what the term was. And then that night I go and I said, I'm going to try shooting a vlog. And I started shooting one and I get back to my, I did two shows in Philly. I get back to my room and I discovered you and the, and and you you became my obsession, and I'm sin sincerely the your your attitude, your work ethic, your 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 office, your organizational skills, your family. Like it, it was really it was at a time where I didn't know what I was doing, and and I was like, I just like when you said your brother tr tr showed you how to edit, and that changed your life. I watched you, and here I am, a stand up comedian on television, and I go. I'm, I'm going to start making a vlog. Like, I, I don't care what my friends think about it. I'm going to make a vlog because I'm watching yours every day. Every fucking day I'd watch it. And I'd look at you and I'd go, oh, that's cool how he does that with the clouds. I'm going to try doing that. And I would just put it in. And then I didn't know how to get good music. So I just ripped music from iTunes. And I wasn't getting money. But I was having so much fun. Uh, so much fun getting gear. You'd talk about gear. And I'd go. Oh, I'm getting that camera. The Canon G7X seems like a good, easy camera to shoot with. Oh, I'm going to get this camera. I, I got so into it. I got so into it. I was tracking my weight loss and I'm posting these and all my friends, Tom Segura, Rogan, they're all making fun of me because they're watching my videos, but they're making fun of me and they're fat shaming me. And all of a sudden this fat shaming thing goes, starts to go viral. And Tom and I start doing a weight loss challenge. This is the, when my career is changing, changing. Ch i had been fired from travel channel. I've been kicked off a tour. I just for no reason, I was going absolutely nowhere in my life. But man, I knew that if I took control of my career the way I was watching you drive your career by yourself with no one tethered, the way we were doing it in podcasting, I went, I think that's a thing. I learned so much in that time. And then all of a sudden, machine story goes viral. I start to sell tickets. I, I stopped vlogging, but what I had was this set of skills that I had learned from you. I had learned from you. It is so meaningful 
for me to be sitting across from you right now because I was so lost. I was a father of two. I fired. I didn't have any money. I was so lost. I watched you every day. And it was like fucking awesome. And I started doing content on Instagram. I listened to you tell me how to do stories. You told, you said stories should be, have an arc. There should be a beginning, middle, and end. If you're going to do a story, tell a story. That's what they're called stories. You were so pivotal in me changing my career. I am here today. Had I not found you, I'm not certain I would be here today. I'm being dead serious. So I have to say, it is an absolute honor to have you on my podcast. Well, fuck, man, I appreciate an that. absolute honor, man. I I had, I had, like, you are the one guest I will ever have on my podcast that I go, oh, I got a lot of fucking questions. I like, love I it. I got a million love, fucking questions. I, you know, I, first of all, I had no idea. Like my- and That's what's beautiful about it. Like, I, I'm a big fan. My wife, like, is fucking loves your stuff. She loves all of your net, Netflix stuff. Like, we're, our house is a big fan of your comedy. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I had no idea. And, you know, just one thing about all of that is- when you're behind, like for me, when I was doing that show every fucking day on YouTube, yeah. day in and day out, there's, it's just such a weird thing because there's nothing between, there's, there's, you don't receive any of that. Meaning like I work all day, I make this thing, I work all night and then I click release and that's it. There's yeah. no audience, no applause, there's no feedback. There's like a bunch of fucking comments, but like that's a cesspool, you're trying to look at that. Like you don't realize that people are watching it or consuming it on the other side. You don't get that feedback like when you're on stage. Yeah, um, I'm not a performer like you are on stage, but I've done a lot of like public speaking and shit. It's very like, there's a symbiosis between you and the audience and YouTube, like posting on YouTube is a one-way street. It's you, you put it out, you have no idea who's receiving it. So it means a lot. Dude, it was. I appreciate it. it I mean, I remember, I remember you, your organization of your office, your old office in New York. And now that I've seen the way your brother Van who's got a new YouTube channel that just launched uh, a, a spirited man. I, it, I'm obsessed with your brother. But when I saw the, the way you organize stuff, I actually said, and my wife can attest, she's in the other room. I'm horrible at cleaning stuff. I went, yeah, man, I should have plugs everywhere. I should have some fuck like you're, where does that come from in your life? I mean, most of that, I, I'll credit Van with most of that genius, but I also think that the house that we grew up in, like there's four of us nice dad kids. It's me and Van, and then we've got another brother and another sister. So four kids. Our house was so fucked up and disorganized. It was like this, like the way Van characterized it is if you needed to fix something, first you'd have to find a tool and then you'd have to find a tool to fix that tool. Like that was everything in our house. Yeah. And I remember like, I was a really bad kid. I remember when I got in a shitload of trouble at school. And I used to keep a padlock on my bedroom door. And when I got in trouble at school, they called home. My mom flipped out. She got a crowbar and broke into my bedroom door. And she said when she got into my bedroom, she was expecting it just to be like a fucking shit show in there. Stuff everywhere. Just a di And she said she got in there and it was immaculate. Like immaculate. And I remember that. Like I was obsessive about that. So I think there was just sort of this like inverse kind of proportionality between the chaos that was this fucked up house we lived in and then like us now as adults with agency over our lives and, and wanting cleanliness and organization and all of that uh, the so. way the way you the way you set up a travel bag i mean i would i changed the way i started traveling because i so i started getting carabiners because you're like oh yeah yeah carabiner here put it on there and then all your stuff's right there and what was happening for me is i was blacking out on planes and i was <laughs> i was leaving everything on the plane i just get off the fucking plane and i saw you fly somewhere and you're like oh yeah i mean it was like like I, I wonder how much of that is like, and especially watching your brother Van, like it, all of a sudden he gets an ax and he's like, oh, I'm going to drill out under the table. So I have a place where it pops out. Is that like, is that obsessive compulsiveness or is it more like, I mean, you know, so that, that stuff's more like real with Van. Like my, my older brother Van is an absolute artistic genius. Like there's no doubt about it. I'm not. I'm someone who like found a thread of maybe creativity or something in what I do and what I like to do. And then just like figured out how to exploit the fuck out of that like <laughs> thread of creativity. Totally exploit serious. Exploit the fuck is like, like I, I would have arguments with Travel Channel about you saying, you got to see what this guy is doing. He went to Hungary with his son. Was it, were you, was it, were you and your son go, flew to like fucking Budapest? Yeah, because we, the airline was like, hey man, we'd love some exposure. And you were like, yeah, I'll shoot some videos yeah, on a first class flight. We went to like Turkey, like taking that kid around the world a dozen times. 
I'm dying to know. Is your son graduated college now? Yeah, he's 23 now. God. Really scary. Damn. Yeah, really scary. It's so weird. Like you got two girls. I've got two babies at home. I know. And it's so easy when they're babies. You know exactly what to do. You keep them alive. You keep them fed. Now, like I got to show up at school every morning. Like you know what to do. The fuck do you do with a 23 year old? I don't know what to do with a 16 year old. That's yeah. It once they hit puberty, it's like. It's like the whole fucking book is out the window. What's but, it like second time parent? Um, it's, you know, I was dirt poor. I was like 16 when, Owen was born two weeks after my 17th birthday. So I was like 16 when we we're having a baby. And we were on welfare. And we like lived in a trailer park. And we got like food stamps and WIC. Like WIC was free diapers and free milk in addition to all that other free shit the state gave us. And now I'm like a rich guy. And I have like these kids. And like, we're pulling our daughter out of one wildly overpriced, fancy private kindergarten and putting her in a different one because maybe it's a better curriculum for, I don't know what's right, <laughs> but like my son turned out great. He's he turned this, out great. He's this beautiful, amazing young man who's like, makes the world a better place. And now I have these girls and like, I don't know if we're messing them up or not. Like, I don't, when she's like, daddy, can I have that? The answer is like, of course you can have, you can have whatever you want, sweetheart. Yeah. I don't know if that's right. <laughs> but with him, it was like, daddy, can I have that? And it's like, well, uh, you can have that teddy bear, but you're not going to get to eat for the next two weeks. Like, so it was <laughs> like, you know, there were answers there. Um, so I don't, it's, it's very different. It's very weird. Um, I, I will say though, even like hearing you talk about watching my, my videos back in the day, like I'm not that kind of person anymore because that was a cadence of like, you talk about like travel channel. I was putting out seven videos a week, every week. Like I think I did 800 days or something like that, 800 days in a row. And each episode was, you know, 10 minutes long. This was like a, a TV show. And they were, I think, sort of produced on a, on a level that could have been on television. Like oh, they were, by far. Yeah. They, they were, were better than anything we were shooting on travel channel. Yeah. Like there were, there were, these productions weren't half-assed and the writing behind that and the editing behind that. Like there were no accidents. Like I, I wanted it to look and feel spontaneous, but there's no accidents. And like the cognitive load that was that, the, the, the carry, the burden on you was so unbelievably overwhelming. So like you talk about my organization on a plane. I haven't thought about that in years, but like I didn't do that because it was neat or it was like part of who I am. But I'm one guy trying to produce this show every single day. And if I'm spending the whole day on a, on a plane, I have to figure out how to make that work for a narrative. So having everything be so precise and so organized was just one less thing I had to worry about. If I have to look for where the, like the fucking backup microphone is, that's gonna affect my production. And my office was the same way. Like all that organization was amazing. And as I started to film in there, the aesthetic of the studio was just like, the cooler it looked, the better the content. So I was incentivized that way. But also like, if I can't find something, if I can't fix something, if something doesn't exist and I have to build it and I don't have access to that, it fucks up my flow. Yeah. So you start to like build your whole life around this hyper level of efficiency to make sure you're able to post that fucking video seven days a week at 8 a.m. So I let's talk, talk logistics of that. Cause I'm curious. I remember th sitting and I would shoot, I would shoot a lot and then I'd go in and I'd, uh, and, and my editing was like, it was like, I, I literally complain sometimes to these guys. I could just cut shit out. It doesn't fucking matter. Like, it was really like, just whatever looks good, I'll hold on to. And then all I need is a couple good shots and a good momentum and a story and I'm good. What was your editing like? How much were you shooting content wise? And what was your editing like? How long did it take you to edit? And, and did you have, did you have a production schedule where you're like, today is going to be, I'm going to go get that leather jacket that I've been wanting to get fixed. And I'm going to, that'll be, that's today's story tomorrow. I want to get a new, uh, you know, how, how did that work? So there was never like, it was, it took so much brain power to figure out one episode. I was never able to really plan out where it got easy was like traveling. Traveling was always the easiest. You want a three act narrative, fly somewhere. Act one, get into the fucking airport. This act is, two, this you're is on the plane. This is everything I've ever wanted out of talking to you. You're act, right, yeah. Act three, <laughs> you arrive. Great fucking story. Like set up, conflict, resolution, perfect. But like when you're in- Can I just stop you? Your wife getting to an airport drives me fucking insane. Like she's like, what? We have 15 minutes till the plane takes off. We'll make it. <laughs> Like you, those, you have no those idea. videos i would just sit there and my hands would get wet i'd be <laughs> like no idea she's, she really like just i'm so I, I want to talk about your wife in a second but keep going so talk about the process of editing these videos and, and making them um <laughs> there's so much to talk about with her she's just a wealth of um 
interestingness. So I was able to plan out in advance because the brain space that day was so intense. But it would be like, like you brought the leather jacket, like I don't know when that was, 2016. I wanted to make this custom jacket and I wanted to reverse engineer this sort of shitty jacket I had and make it custom. And I was like, that's a great story. So when I knew that like I had an appointment that day to go meet with my friend who could get it done, I was like, this is a great story. So I'd be really deliberate in like setting it up, getting there. That's why like riding an electric skateboard is cool, but it's also great content. I knew yeah. that. I knew that it was like a, a, that was a juicy orange I could squeeze so much content out of. So getting there, I was like, okay, that's act one. Then it's like act two, meeting with this guy, he's gonna take me to this place, showing the leather, that's great. It's act two, great, got that in the bag. Act three, it's like, okay, people are gonna stop caring about this fucking leather jacket. I got to like take it somewhere else. Okay, act three is going to be me going home and then interacting with the wife and the kid. That's going to feel like wholesome. That's three acts. That's a perfect package. So when you talk about writing, like that was the process of writing and that was in my head. And then all the while, like every time I talked to camera, it was meant to feel super spontaneous and conversational. But like, I think almost without exception, every word that I said, and I mean that literally like every word, every syllable was somewhat premeditated. How can I say this as concisely as possible? Like right now we're having a genuine conversation. Yeah. I'm not thinking about how to say what I'm trying to say to you, Bert, but then it was like, okay, I gotta say this to the camera. How can I say this in fewest words? How can I say this in a way that's really understandable? How can I say this in a way that makes sense? So like, that's how I'm writing in real time. Mm -hmm. So what percentage of that actually made the cut? Like of me speaking to camera, it was high. It was probably 50% of like the B-roll where it's like me setting the stage, showing the environment, leaning into my set, which was New York City. That was more like 20%. I'm always shooting the city. I'm always fixing the camera, putting the tripod down. Yeah. Then there's this careful balance. Like it can't be all handheld. Shaky camera is annoying. It can't be all tripod. It looks too contrived. I loved watching you learn how to use a drone. Yeah, I mean, like- It was so fun. It was so, it was so fun to watch you learn to use a drone and go, oh yeah, we're using drones on our show. Oh, he's, oh, this is, oh, cool. And then I was like, I'm getting a fucking drone. <laughs> it was, it was such a fun- so keep going. So, so then you have all this, how long, how long did it take you to edit one of your vlogs? So I'd say for the first six months, it was an hour a minute. So to get a minute of finished video, it took me an hour of editing. And then I would say by the end, I was able to get that down to maybe, maybe th three minutes in an hour. So never did an edit take me less than, you know, three hours kind of thing, um, oh four hours, but typically it would be like a six hour lift every day. So like I, I would get home and like do the whole like family thing with the camera off, which is just pretending. Like that's the thing that really like Bert, no one knew about was like, even thinking about this now, I'm getting anxiety thinking about like, I was faking being a dad. I was faking being a husband. This like is when the Candace one. would look yes. at me and have some deep conversation and I'm shaking my head, I'm like, Casey, you fucking act present right now. Act like you're actually listening. Act like you're paying attention. Even though all that's going on in my head is like, gotta get this vlog out, gotta get this vlog out, gotta get this vlog out. Well, that's um, what happened to me was it, I, I had my 44th birthday party and I was vlogging about it. And in that day, I realized I was cannibalizing the experience. I was not allowed, my ego, my, I was, I found all of a sudden the things I wouldn't do for directors on Travel Channel, I was very readily about to do for myself. Second take, hey guys, what's up? Like, and and all of a sudden I was like, wait, I'm not enjoying my birthday party. I'm vlogging it. And I and I was like, I got I have to stop. I have to stop vlogging. I want to say that was my last vlog because I was like, my birth birthday is very intimate to me. I, I go and I have dinner by myself and I write my goals for the year. Every year you do this? Every year, every year I've always done it. And it's starting on my 26th birthday when I got into comedy. And I just have accomplished all those goals always. And so it's very intimate. Now all of a sudden I'm telling the word about something very intimate. And my wife would do something. And I'd go, I wish I had my fucking camera. You this say, is say, great. Say this it again. Is, yeah. Sweetheart, say it again. A little louder. Look to camera. Look to camera. Say it again. Yeah, it was so gross. It's, oh. it's. I, I mean, you say cannibalizing your birthday party. I It cannibalized my entire existence. Like, in the pursuit of having the most interesting life for my content, I had no life at all. Like my whole life was just making that work. And I have no regrets because when I look back at it, it only becomes more and more valuable to me. And, you know, you, you talk about sort of having this disarray in your life and then figuring out what you want to do five years ago. It was very much the same for me. Like I had achieved a lot of things in my life, but none of it was sort of 
bankable. None of it was long-term. None of it had legs up until that point. Like I, I had this show on HBO, worked my whole life for it. Nobody fucking watched it. They didn't renew it. The money from that was gone really quickly. It went away. Um, I made a lot of money directing TV commercials. I got to direct a couple a year. It wasn't a really lucrative thing. There was no long-term there. So when I found the, that daily show, the vlog, it was like everything I had had to be expended right now. It's like, it's like a, a, a sprint and I knew it was a sprint and I couldn't stop until I was across some sort of finish line. And I was so fucking aware of that. And like that thing I talk about where I wasn't really a husband, I was just pretending then. I was so conscious of it at the time and I was just promising myself like, I'll get past this, I'll get past this. And then sometimes I have to say that to her. I was like, like we, she pulled me into, like we were doing like marital counseling and therapy. Like we were on the precipice of divorce throughout that entire you, you brought production. That up. You, you talked about that subtly in, and, and I, and I, I think I had tapped out of YouTube at a, at a time. And I think I came back and I heard something about that. I think it was right around the time you were thinking about moving to LA yeah. and I was like, wait, what the fuck? And then I, and then all of a sudden there's too much body of work for me to Catch go up. back and find it. And I'm like, so I'm like, Oh fuck. They took a tra- trip to South Africa. I've always been fascinated about your wife. I've always been fascinated about the backstory of your wife. I know so very little about her. She's other than other than woman. I think I would like drinking with her dad. Um, I think I would really enjoy drinking with that man. And it just seemed so fun when you guys went to South Africa. It it looked like, and I've been to South Africa nice. like four four times, and I never had as much fun as you did. Those that one trip that I I was one I caught up on, but yeah, I mean, so it was. It was like I had such a self awareness of the temporariness of the fuse that was that daily show. Like, this is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. It wasn't sustainable for me from a health perspective. And it also wasn't sustainable where like, people are going to get sick of this. They're going to get sick of this. I can't keep going. And I was so aware of that. So it was just like, it was holding my breath. And it was like, no, I've got to keep holding it. I've got to keep holding it. And like, we go to marriage counseling. And like, there were moments where like, Candace was like crying to her therapist being like, why can't he just take weekends off? And she was probably right. But I knew the minute I took a minute off, I'd never go back. And like, here we are, Bert. So like when you're bringing up those moments, it's so fucking foreign to me because I've swung so far in the opposite direction. Yeah, I don't do anything now. I do jack shit. I do nothing. My agent will call me with great opportunities and I'll be like, yeah, how much time is it? Two hours, dude. Nah, let's pass on this one. Like, that's the level I'm at right now. Like, I do fucking nothing. My house, like my studio is a fucking mess. Really? Nothing's organ. No, it's a mess. I do nothing. How are you running? I'm still super fit. Because I'm like, that makes me happy. But that's selfish. I don't tweet about that. Like, that's not like, I'm not doing that for content or work. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) that's all I do. It's like, it's like, um, it's like, like surfing. Yeah. I I think part of the reason I'm so attracted to surfing is like you can't have a camera with you when you surf. So when I'm out there like floating in the middle of the ocean for four hours a day <laughs> as an adult. Well, I would beg to differ. <laughs> and so would Kai Lenny, uh Nathan ja- Florence, Jamie O'Brien. Jamie like, O'Brien. Yeah. <laughs> like I saw you went surfing with Jamie, right? Yeah, Jamie's yeah. a great friend. I Dude, love that guy. But see, all those guys, like I it's crazy. Like I, I've always, you know, to go back to like the thing that got you into the, to the thing, like the thing that got me into the entertainment business was being a fan of shit. Mm. Like I'll never lose that. I'm a, I'm a legit fan of yours. I had a kid pull me aside. My, my listeners know this story. Um, but it, it, very drunk, shirtless New Year's Eve and I, me and the kid and a meet and greet line. And he's like, I'm a fan of yours. And I said, I got it. And he goes, no, you need to give me a second. So you understand what that means. I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go. He says, just give me a second. He goes, I, I don't have anything going on in my life. But when you succeed, I feel like I succeeded because I picked you. Do you understand that? Yeah, and I was like, powerful. I was like, wow. He goes, like, when you go on Rogan and kill it, I know I get to show that to my friends and go, remember that guy Bird I told you about, the guy I'm a fan of? Watch this. And he's like, so keep busting your ass because you're doing it for both of us. And all of a sudden I'm getting chill bumps. And I was like, that's what this I'm I'm a legit fan of yours where i when you sign a deal with cnn i go fuck yeah get that money you do your app i'm like i bought I downloaded the app like i did like that's a fan and i never want to lose that perspective and 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 it's but it's interesting to hear you say because i watched i watched you blow up i'm curious to where you started like 
because I know about the the Neistat brothers. I know a lot about your 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 childhood. We moved moved in with Van, and and he adopted you, and then you went back yet, Owen. I'm curious of like when you met Candace. Where were you? What were you doing? I also know, and I'm a little bit about the Nike commercial, which you just hijacked and traveled around the world with. Yeah, so that those are pretty much all the um, tent posts. They're just totally out of order. So, so walk me through uh, yeah, it. Yeah, so like southeastern Connecticut, like we lived in a military industrial town. Like when Reagan left office, all my friends' parents lost their jobs on the submarine base. Like that was sort of our upbringing. Um, I'm the last gen. You're a little older than me, but like I'm the last generation to grow up without video games or internet. So we were just like yeah. playing on the railroad tracks as kids, and like Van's whole spirited man, my brother's whole spirited man thing is about making shit with your hands because that's who we were as kids yeah um and then yeah like i had a pretty tumultuous kind of teenage childhood like always had a really drugs not drugs just contentious relationship with my mother okay um really had a lot of beef with my mom as a kid and rebelled in school didn't like any of it and then like got in a big fight with my mom when i was 15 and she sort of delivered an ultimatum which was like do this or get out of this house and i was like I gotta go. Like, I can't let this woman, who does, who does she think she is? Yeah. And I left and I never went back. To this day, I never went back. Not once. Is your mom still alive? Yeah, yeah, I was texting with her today. And you guys are cool? I mean, sort of. She's like texting me today about Jesus. And I'm like, mom, <laughs> you know how I feel about the fucking Catholic church. <laughs> Don't get into this with me, mom. Um, but yeah, like, we, yeah, I'm cool yeah. with everybody in my family. But then it was a really different story. So I ran away from home and like, knocked up my girlfriend and had a baby and it was really scary. And then when my baby mama dumped me, when Owen's mom dumped me, I had like this grandiose vision of moving to New York City someday, which was two hours from where I was. And then when she dumped me, I was just like, fuck this. And I upped and I moved. And I moved to New York City with like 800 bucks. That's it. No job, no education, 10th grade high school education, no GED. And my only work experience was like washing dishes in a kitchen. And it was just a hustle. It was like a miserable, really scary hustle at a three month sublet. And on top of all that, I moved to New York City, June, 2001. So my three month sublet was up <laughs> September one. I had oh, no place to go. God. So September one, 2001, I moved in with some friends of a friend. So let me sleep on their couch for a hundred bucks. And they lived on Rector Street, just below the World Trade Centers. And exactly 10 days after I moved onto their couch was September 11th, 2001, and fucking terrorists blew up their apartment. Oh my God. Yeah, like blew it up. Like our apartment windows blew it. And like, that was my welcome to New York City. And meanwhile, like I'm trying to figure all this shit out and like I'm working as an assistant, making 10 bucks an hour under the table and like doing anything I could. And I'm also going back to Connecticut three days a week to like be with my boy. So he was little then. Yeah. And like, we're now all of a sudden we got like this shared custody situation. Um, eventually figured it out. And by figured it out, I mean like I got a, was a job that was decent. And then I started to like figure out how to make a little bit of money off of videos and Van quit his job. And I had a day job so I could support sort of Van and me while Van and I figured out together how to make money off of our movies. And then we both quit our jobs and we were just making money off of our movies. And it was like some months, no problem paying rent. Some months we go out to dinner. And then some months it was like going to Josh, the landlord, being like, Josh, you know we're good for rent this month. We need a couple more days. We're going to come up with it. And it was like that for a really long time. And then like 2008. Now at this time, Van's partying, right? Van and I both were like, I mean, like I'm 21, 22, yeah. Van's 27. We're in New York City. No responsibilities. Like, God, you know, this is before social media, before camera phones. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, Van was a big drinker. I was a big drinker. All we did was party. And then, you know, it's like 2008, we got the deal to make the HBO show. It was the first time we had real money. And then that was sort of where things took off. And then 2010, it came out. Van and I kind of split up, went separate ways. He moved out here. I stayed there, started doing commercials, made decent money. 2015 was the vlog, and that's when I really found it. Father's Day is just around the corner. And you probably need a gift for a hairy dad. Make your dad proud this year and get him and yourself the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right. The Lawnmower 4.0. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code BERT at Manscaped. Manscaped is honestly the best trimmer I've ever used in my entire life. It's the only one I'll use on my junk. 
I was an old school guy that would use hair clippers and I use liners. And I'm telling you, you get a nick. And the best thing about these Manscaped trimmers is they got a light on it and they got the ceramic blade that is a no nick. They're, they're absolutely awesome. I'll get back to the copy, but I just got to tell you for real, I don't trim. I use these things for my face because of that light. It, look how tight that line is. I know I shouldn't be using the thing on my balls that I use on my lip, but they're my balls. Quite honestly, I'd suck my own dick if it's not good. Imagine surprising your dad with a sleek, well-designed, and optimized body hair trimmer that says, your balls will thank you on the box. This is their fourth generation trimmer featuring cutting edge ceramic blade. I'm telling you, this is a reduced grooming accidents thanks for their advanced skin safe technology. This is all the shit I was talking about. I'm telling you right now. The 4,000K LED spotlight on and off for a more precision shave. You can shave your balls in the dark. I'm telling you, that light comes in so fucking handy. This is the perfect gift. Have you ever seen a nose bush sticking out of your dad's face? The Weed Whacker Nose Ear Hair Trimmer is the best hair trimmer on the market. And it's a perfect gift for your pops. They also have amazing products like the Clone, Crop Mop, Ball Wipes, Crop Reviver, Ball Toner, Crop Preserver, Ball Deodorant. I'm telling you right now. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code BIRD at Manscaped.com. Get your dad a gift you know he will use. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code BERT. Don't forget that you came from your dad's bowls this year. Show the original home some love with Manscaped. We all know that I've struggled with weight loss my entire, not my entire life, just my adult life. And I got to be honest with you, I kind of get lost in my approach. I feel like my approach is super unhealthy. Well, if you're like me, you can sign up for a trial and get psychological-based support and motivation to reach your goals at noom.com slash birdcast. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash birdcast. Noom empowers you with the knowledge to build smarter, more sustainable habits and behaviors using cognitive behavioral approach. You're going to focus on the why you do what you do when it comes to eating instead of the what to change your relationship with eating. Everyone's journey is different. So Noom customizes a program for you based on your personal goals. No food is totally off limits, thank God. Keep eating the foods you love while maintaining a healthier balance. An off day is totally okay. It won't send a set you off course. Noom gem- gently helps you get back on course, and it only asks for 10 minutes of your day to teach you about e- eating habits and checking in on your progress. And this is the science behind Noom is, is beautiful. More than 80% of users complete the program. More than 60% of them lose 5% or more of their body weight. And 60% of them keep the weight off for a year or more. Noom has built the entire platform on two things. Research and wanting to help people lead healthier lives. I'm telling you right now, start building healthier habits, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash BirdCast. That's N-O-O-M dot com. Slash Birdcast. And then, and when did you meet Candace? So meeting Candace is an interesting story. Candace was like the super, super hot New York City girl with like the ultra fancy boyfriend. And I was like this fucking kind of dope who had no money, but was like- No always, offense, Casey. I know who you are. <laughs> you don't know who I was in 2004. In yeah. 2004, I was just like this fucking maniac. Like this 23 year old maniac who like I lived in an SRO, a single room occupancy. So I had no bathroom and no kitchen in my apartment. It was just a 12 by 12 box. The bathroom was down the hall. Yeah. Like you go in there and sometimes there'd be needles on the floor. Like just don't step on them. Like sometimes there'd be blood all over the sink. Like, well, I'll brush my teeth tomorrow. Like that was my lifestyle. And like she's this really glamorous girl. And I found out she broke up with her boyfriend. I just like cold called her. I'm like, hey, you remember me? And she's like, I think so. Who are you? Are you the guy with the kid? And I'm like, yeah, you want to go out? The guy with the kid. By the way, that is, it's funny. You know, <laughs> you know someone's voice, like when you've watched enough of them. And I can totally hear her saying that. Are you the guy with the kid? That was like 27 year old Candace. Yeah. yeah. And so she wouldn't go out with me or call me back. And then we were both, Van and I were both invited to a bar mitzvah in Houston. And Candace is from, like she grew up in Houston. She's born in South Africa. She grew up in I'm Houston. I'm dying to know about her background because- I couldn't, I could, I, I can't put my finger on it. If it's blood diamonds or like where, <laughs> where her family's like. It's, I, it's not that sexier. Interest. It sort of is like they're South African. Like yeah, they're, they're South all African. South African. 
when she grew born and raised there. Yeah, born okay. in, but she moved to they emigrated to the United States when she was fairly young because shit started to go really south. This is when like Mandela was in jail, like the whites were trying to stay in power down there. Mm -hmm. And her family, like some of her family history, like they fought on behalf of of the native black South Africans. Like they're it's good. Her good lineage, side of the fence of history the, to be on. It, they're, on, they're on the right side of the fence, but it got very tumultuous, very scary for them. So her parents are like, not quite as sexy as blood diamonds. They're physicians. Her, her dad's a doctor. Damn it. Sorry, I know. Not, Damn it. not as romantic. But, um, and at the time they were like, they needed doctors in Australia and they needed doctors in Texas. And if you pass the board in South Africa, they would sort of accept that in either of those two locations. And her mother fucking hates this, the Australian accent. So like, I guess we're moving to Texas. Oh, wow. So they like upped and left their whole life behind in South Africa and moved to Houston, lived in a hotel until her dad kind of figured it out. And she was raised in Houston and would spend, you know, like a decent percentage of her, of her years back in South Africa. Yeah. Like the story of it that really hits it for me was like her family's house burned down in, in Texas like came home, everything's gone. And her and her sister were like four and six or something like that. And her mom brought her to Target, bought them a backpack, bought them clothes, filled the backpack up with clothes, brought them to the airport and put these two little kids on an airplane by themselves and just sent them to South Africa. Because like, what were her parents supposed to do? They had no place to live. They had to yeah. figure out, like their whole life just burned down literally. So they just shipped the kids off to South Africa. And hearing Candace tell the story of being like six or eight year old, just flying to Cape Town by herself, you know, that's like a 20 hour flight. Oh, that, oh no, I, 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 for me, I had, it was a 33 hour flight. It yeah. was like through London. Yeah. Through London's the quickest way now. But in yeah. any event, so like that's yeah. her, that was sort of her upbringing. So when we got invited to the bar mitzvah in Texas, she was like, if you want to stay at my parents' house, you can. And we're like, do I? She's not there. She was there. She was oh, also she, invited she, to the bar mitzvah because she knew the person because they were from Houston. Oh, wow. The kid's dad was a, like a patron of the art. So he sort of knew us as Van and I were in the art world. Yeah. She knew him because of a similar connection. So we're staying at her house and I was like, fuck, man, this is all I need. Like, I got this girl. I got her cornered. Like, I got this. <laughs> and like, you, Bert, you should know, like, I got it. <laughs> she, she rejected me really coldly. Yeah. And I always oh, no. say to her, like, we see two kids later who had the last fucking laugh here, lady. Yeah. Oh, like, what's, what's great is knowing, you know, Knowing who this sounds, I hope this comes off right. Knowing who Candace is, just from vlogs, the fact that she married you shows you how good of a person she is. Because in my head, I kept going, Casey is not from the same pedigree as, as Candace. No, she is and royalty. <laughs> and so, literally, I mean, I remember what, there was one time where she gave you a Rolex for something for yeah. your, and I was like, really broke it. Yeah, and you were like, <laughs> I was like, this is, this is not the guy to give a Rolex to. No, like I'm wearing a plastic watch right now. Like everything I own is made out of rubber. Yeah. No, she, um, I, the story I always tell about her is it's like, I never was single when I had money or fame. All I had when I was like single out there mixing it up was this face. <laughs> like this is my own, this is you it. You have had that face since you were a child. I the picture of you and Van on when we were his, little kids. I go, I go, right? that is Casey. That is Casey Neistat to a T. No, I exact always, same spot. Never looked different. But like that was it. And Candace, like I, we still went out. And like the story I love to tell is like, especially like when I was making the vlog and like our lives got fancy and everybody's like, oh, she just likes him because she's such a bitch in the oh. vlog. It's awesome. Everybody's oh, like, it's great. <laughs> it's such a good character. Everybody's like, she only likes him because he's like you know, got money and he's got fame. So that's why she likes him. And it's like, little do they know. Like, yeah. I remember the days when she would come to Connecticut with me because I, I wouldn't stay in the city on the weekends. So I had to be with my boy. And she would come to Connecticut with me. And it was like, look, your choice is you can like stay with me and Owen in my grandmother's like guest bedroom. Or oh. we can like, it was really like fucking humiliating. Here's this girl, like her previous boyfriend, like the guy owned like a half a dozen hotels. And I'm like, you know, we got to take the train or the bus to Connecticut and That's then stay at my awesome. Nana's house. And like every once in a while, she would like get us a hotel room that we could stay in. So we'd have like some place to stay with my kid and like use her credit card. And like, <sighs> that makes me, that yeah. makes me like Candace. She's a woman of integrity. So much like, so, I mean, I've, 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 you know, you form a relationship with these people that you watch all the time and, and you, mm. and you feel certain things from me. You're like, oh, I, 
want to party with her. I really, I keep going. I want to party with her dad. Now that I know her dad's like, Hey buddy, slow down. You're 40, 48 where the drinking is going to catch up to you. I'm a doctor. And it's a little different than a blood diamond uh, merchant, but it's funny. I said, um, I was telling uh, my trainer today that, uh, she, she commented on Leanne's earrings and I said, uh, you know, what's really cool about those earrings is I go, she didn't marry me ever expecting to get those earrings. <laughs> like she married a loser. Like all her friends are like, why would you marry a comic? She had a panic attack when she realized she was in love with me. And I go, yeah, but she like, she was a good person that fell in love with. It didn't, she was like, I don't care what car he has or this. I like this guy. And it makes you like the woman so much more when you go, Wow, you, I remember she was embarrassed her when we, uh, first time we went home, she was embarrassed. She was like, just so you know, my dad, my dad lives in a convenience store. And I was like, okay. She's like, we're staying with my dad. And I was like, all right. She's like, so we're staying in the convenience store this weekend. And I was like, and at first I was like, wow, that seems weird. Then I fell in love with it. I was like, wait. <laughs> I can drink all night long and eat whatever the fuck I want. And we were staying in the cooler. Like, we, we, so it was ice cold. It was like, this is a dream of mine. But yeah, that's, that must've been interesting. Did, was there a culture shock for you and your brother when you were with her that first time in her family? Yeah. I mean, like, and very literally, I remember her parents are very traditional, very traditional. They've, they've loosened up now, but especially back then when they have this like beautiful daughter that, you know, men are chasing after mm -hmm they were very traditional in sort of what they imagined her life being. They wanted like a nice Jewish doctor to marry her or something. Um, Candace's sister is literally married to a very nice Jewish doctor. Um, and her parents meet me like that first weekend in their house. And like Candace told me after we started dating that like her mom pulled her aside and was like, the, that one Casey, the younger one, he's in love with you, Candace, watch out. And her dad pulled her aside and was like, you know, be careful because I don't want to have to support you for the rest of your life. And if you marry an artist, that's what it's going to be. Oh, wow. And that's sort of how they treat it. And her parents were always lovely. And like, most people don't know this about our, our, our relationship, but like Candace and I got married three weeks after we started dating. And then we had to get it annulled. It's kind of a funny story. We, we like really fell hard for each other. So we got, went and got, we eloped in like our bathing suits and a judge married us. And we told her parents and they kind of freaked out and all this stuff. And then we like, we're like, okay, we got to undo this. So to get it annulled, you have to prove that either the drug, the judge was under the influence of drugs or alcohol. There's no way to prove that. Yeah. Or she was married under false pretenses, which means I either couldn't provide children. I got a kid. Couldn't. That yeah. one's easy to do. Yeah. Or I was gay. So she went in front of a judge in Texas <laughs> And said, look, I married this artist. Wait, in 19? Wait, wait, in this 2004? 2007, yeah. 2007? I married this artist from New York. I didn't realize that he is gay. And the judge was like, against my better instincts, I will grant you this, <laughs> this annulment. <laughs> oh, that's great. So like that, so her parents, yeah, they were wildly skeptical. And like, I remember, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly, but there was like a moment in those early days of she and I dating. And I was like really broke, like- tens or hundreds of dollars in the bank account to my name. You know, I couldn't get a credit card because I'd yeah. maxed them out and never paid for them. Like I had no, like that's it. Yeah. No safe, nothing. No parents asked for my, like nothing. And I remember like she came to Connecticut with me once and we like stayed at, I think it was probably my grandmother's house or something. And like she had like, this rash all over her because we slept in a bed in the attic that was like, had fucking horse hair on or something. <laughs> like I'm not kidding. And we're in the car, which is a rental car that she paid for she didn't want to take the bus there. She didn't yeah. want to. And she just like kind of broke down. She started crying. And like, I knew in the back, I knew for a fact that like two years ago with her, with her previous boyfriend that like they were at the Hotel du Cap in fucking Cannes, you know, in like the South of France. Yeah. And she just like starts crying. And I was like, what is it? And she's like, I just, this isn't how I imagined it. This isn't how I imagined it. And that was like so hard for me. And I like grabbed her and I was like, look, I just need a little bit of time. I was like, I'll get you whatever you want. What do you want? You want a private jet? I'll buy you a jet. I'll get you that jet. Just give me a little bit of time. And like, she calmed down and like, you know, like she wasn't, it wasn't about the material possessions. It was just like, my life was a struggle then. Yeah. And she had been pulled into that struggle. And then like, I want to say this was like three years ago, we were in LA. I was in LA for a shoot and her family, her mom came out to help with like the kids because Candace came with the kids for this shoot. And at the end of the shoot, I like called the brand, which I won't mention. And I was like, 
uh, I, I was like, I need a plane home. And they're like, sure, we'll get you a jet. So like that day, like I walked her and her mom under like our own G4 to fly back. Like I got her that jet. Dude. Yeah, good story. That's, that, that's cause that's, you know, the, the guy we all root for is the, cause that's who we all feel like we are. That's our hero story is piss broke. Mine wasn't Leanne. <laughs> Mine wasn't Leanne <laughs> complaining about me. Leanne had a meltdown and then came to me and was like, I think I'm bad luck. And I went, what? She goes, you were doing so good before you met me. I've been poor my whole life. I've never had any money. I've never been successful. I think I'm bad luck. And I remember going, by the way, I am I will say this till the day I die. That day I die, I'll go, I was still lucky. I'm the luckiest man in the world. No one's ever luckier than me. No one can match my luck. I have more luck than anyone will ever get, ever, ever, ever. And I remember thinking, I'm going to change her life. I'm so lucky, I'm going to take her with me. And I want to prove to her that life isn't always negative, that you can, that you, that you can make money, you can succeed, you can to have an idea, sell it as a project, to to be a part of that, like uh, down in the low bottoms, and then to yeah. it's such a great, yeah, and, and for yeah, and 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 I feel like I took that journey with you. Like I feel like it's that's what's crazy is I feel like I took that journey with you. I I watched you con like consecutively get more recognized around New York, Casey, and I was like, yeah, like every time you did that. I was like, God damn it, man, we're killing it in my head. I was like, we're fucking killing it. You know, there was also like, I was very quick to sort of show in those videos. I don't really be able to really recognize this and talk about it in retrospect, but like show the success. But like I was, there was a lot of shame I had when I first started those videos because of like my financial position. Like when I started those vlogs, like the very first episodes, when I started my tech company, I was in like, $170,000 in credit card debt and bank debt. Really? Yeah, because I, I had no, I was making decent money. I was probably, you know, I was making like good money, like a hundred grand a year doing my TV commercials and my videos and all this stuff. Then I started to start, start a tech company. Yeah, so, so tell me, like kind of walk me through. I was always curious. The vlog seemed like a secondary it um, was, it project was. for you. And then you had your your tech company and then and then you morphed your tech company if I'm not mistaken, into, into a podcast company, correct? Yeah, sort of. Okay, so wait, talk me through. So I'm interested that. about the finances of it too. Yeah, yeah. So it, it it's not that complicated, but basically it was like that Nike video that you talked about was like, you know, 2010, our HBO show premiered. We had a lot of attention, but not a lot of money and no second season. But after that, I was directing TV commercials, one after another. After another. And then I got this opportunity to make a Nike video. In the Nike video, instead of making a commercial, I stole the budget and I made this wild video. It's such a great, it's that so went great. crazy viral. It's so great. Thank you. And that really like launched me into like the stratosphere in that space. And it was amazing because every brand would call me and they'd be like, hey, we want you to make a video for us. Make it just like the Nike one. And I was like, great. But then it was like years of doing just that, literally three or four years of doing just that. And I was like, I couldn't do it. Like I, I, I had exhausted that. And you're still upside down financially, meaning no. You're still I, this in is debt? when I was doing okay. This is when I was making so like hundred grand. Are you, are you paying off debt of all the credit cards for you have? This as was a kid? yeah. This was when I was like, I'm in the black here. Like I'm doing fucking okay. great. And then I get like the biggest deal of my life, which is I get invited to go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology (MIT) as a fellow, and work inside of the um, inside of a lab there, as like a, a filmmaker in residence. And for a fucking high school drop, public school dropout, <laughs> yeah, this was like a huge deal to me. Like academia was one nut that I had no idea how I'd ever crack. And I promised myself this. I was like, I'm moving to Massachusetts. I'm moving to Cambridge. I'm going to MIT. I'm not going to work while I'm there. And on the other side of this, I'm doing something new with my career because I can't keep making the Nike video over and over and over. I've got no other prospects. Yeah. So I did that. When I was at MIT, I learned about technology and I was like, I can do this. I've got ideas. Like I can pull people together. I can build a tech company. That's what I want to do. I read all these fucking books. People got in my brain. They're like, you could do it, Casey. And so then I moved back to New York and I started that company. But within that process, you're talking like six, seven months more of not working and spending. And that was when the debt just started to accumulate. I needed a physical space to work out of. Expensive. I needed to bring on partners. Expensive. Yeah, I would look at that that office of yours, and I was like, like 
I remember when you took you took over the other yeah, side or whatever, and expensive. I was like, I was like, how much is this costing? You know, thousands and thousands of months, everything out of pocket, everything, and it just started to pile up. And the thing about that tech company is there are no prospects for it to make revenue. And when I raised capital, I couldn't give myself a paycheck. You know, we raised a couple hundred grand to start that company. I couldn't start paying myself from that. Yeah. So just into debt and into debt and into debt. And even when I started the vlog, I remember then Candace and I had an apartment in the city, and we were splitting the rent on it. And like, there were many months, more months than not, where Candace would be like, hey, you never gave me your half of the rent. And I'd always have some excuse like, ugh, okay, let me call my accountant. I'm so sorry. I don't know why you don't have it yet. And I just didn't have the money. Yeah. And that was like when I was vlogging. So I was really kind of embarrassed and I hid it from the vlog. And then I remember like when those checks started hitting my account. So yeah, the, the YouTube checks? The YouTube checks came first. And I remember it was like, um, you know, I never turned my monetization on on my YouTube channel. This is like a fact that most people just don't get. But I did 100 million views before I turned on monetization. Because it, it, to me at the time, and this is wrong, and I fucking regret this, and I'm an idiot for doing this. But I felt like there was some degree of integrity. Like by not monetizing them, I was doing them for the art of it. Yeah. Fuck that. Like I'm an <laughs> idiot for doing that. Don't ever do that. If you do that, I don't think you're an artist. I think you're a fucking idiot. And I was a fucking <laughs> idiot for doing that. But I didn't mind. So I remember I turned it on. And I remember like the first month, it was like six grand. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, that covers rent and like, shit, we got to dinner and I'm, daddy's paying. Yeah. And then like the next month, it was like 16 grand. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like 16 times 12. Holy shit. Yeah. And then the next month it was like 60 grand. And that's when I was like, no. Uh -oh. And then like, it just didn't stop. And then it's like, you know, you're it's six figures and multiples and, and then the brands start calling. And then like, that was a big shift for me. It was like all that commercial work that I talked about, I did. It was always about my creativity. It was like, write these treatments, like, you know, yeah. a pitch deck or like these ideas. Here's my creative idea. The brand would be like, oh, you're so creative. We're excited to work with you. Let's, and then none of that discussion. It was just how much for you to talk about our brand on your channel. They weren't paying me for my creativity. They were paying me for my reach. Wow. And I remember wow. that happening. And at first wow. I felt insulted. I was like, wait, you don't want to know what I'm doing? Like, we don't care. Whatever you want to do. Samsung. I mean, Samsung was a great brand. Yeah. They let me do whatever I wanted creatively. I, 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 I remember... So uh, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Jamie Vernon, you know who Jamie Vernon is? Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan's yeah. uh, producer is a huge fan of yours also. I appreciate and it. And we would, we would, I would show up early to do Rogan and we would just, I remember he got the fucking, the board, the board. He's like, Bert, I got one. I was the, like, shut the, the fuck up. Board, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> but I was like, I was like, I, uh, we would talk about your, and, and I remember, I think Rogan got a Samsung and he was like, yeah, I just got this Samsung. And Jamie and I looked at each other. We're like, someone watches Casey. <laughs> <laughs> they make a, they make a great product. Much love to Samsung. So wait, you would get we're, now were the were the were the boosted boards a product? Well, boosted was a start. They didn't have any money. Yeah. So I had some equity in the company. They went tits up though and like lost everything. Oh, for um, real? Yeah, and it wasn't the founder's fault. They brought in new management. They pushed out the fact. You've heard the story a million times, but yeah. like they went, they drove it into the ground, which is really heartbreaking. Boosted board. Uh, the fucking solo wheel one that you wrote. Yeah, one wheels. They're still doing well. That's a super fun product, man. That's it's, a great product. It's really interesting to me because I did see you as a brand ambassador of cool shit. I, I felt like you would weed out the bad shit. I mean, I started uh, unboxing. You get a boxes of stuff and you'd pull out your fucking big knife and cut it open. To this day, I do not unbox anything without a, a fucking so great like, knife <laughs> and 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 i and i think of you just recklessly cutting into shit how many times i have ruined sweatshirts just and i'm like oh fuck <laughs> if yeah I, if i had known how much people would latch on to the time that i got a brand new laptop and i just <laughs> i did it then because it made me laugh yeah and i was like that's a funny joke and if that joke's three grand it's a funny <laughs> joke but like you know how beautiful the apple yeah laptop box box are. it's a big jewelry box and instead of like lifting the knife went straight into the top and straight across <laughs> and my brand new laptop had this gash in it and the internet went fucking nuts fucking nuts like to this day people bring that up to me this podcast is brought to you by hims did you know that 66 percent of men start losing their hair by the age of 35 look at this look at this it almost even looks darker a little bit 
I died right here. It's for the movie. But here's the point. I still have hair. Why do I still have hair? Because I did something about it. I was 22 when I started losing my hair and I had to go to a doctor. You don't have to do that anymore. I had to wait in a pharmacy line. You don't have to do that anymore. They offered a bunch of snake pill remedies. You don't have to do anymore because for hymns was, hymns was created by a man that knew that a lot of these conversations men would rather have online than in a doctor's office. It's super simple. All you got, these are, by the way, results backed by science. For hymns is going to connect you with a licensed medical professional online, which would save you hours, completely just confidential and discreet. Answer a few quick questions and a medical professional will review. And if they determine it's right for you, they can prescribe you the medication to treat your hair loss that is shipped directly and discreetly to your door. Today, Hims is giving you the best offer yet. If you're not happy with the results and after 90 days, Hims will give you a full refund. And right now, my listeners can get their first visit absolutely for free. Go to 4 slash birdcast. That's 4 slash birdcast. Remember, prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's 4 slash birdcast. The summer is upon us, folks. And if you're like me, you like to put on one pair of shorts in the day, in the morning and wear them all day long. A pair of shorts you can jump in the pool with, jump in the lake with, get in the ocean with, and then wear for a jog because they've got great support. They dry quickly and bird dogs are those shorts you're looking for. I'm telling you right now, my family is at the lake in Alabama and I am dying because when I go to Alabama, I bring three pairs of bird dogs and I interchange them. I hang them up to dry at the end of the day. They dry on me for Christ's sakes. I jog in them. I do everything in these bird dogs. They are absolutely fantastic. And by the way, I got these bird dogs before they were a sponsor of the podcast. That's how legit these shorts are. If you thought the rubber clogs were good, listen to this giveaway. Go to birddogs.com and enter the promo code BIRD, and they will throw in a free bird dog whistle tip football. Ooh, good for summer. Remember those Nerf Vortex Howler footballs that whistle when you throw them? The the footballs you can literally throw a mile? That's birddog.com, and the promo code is BIRD, and boom. A free bird dog whistle tip football with your pair of bird dogs. You will not take things these, these things off, I promise you. You will throw them on in the morning, you will wear them all day long, and then they're going to look so nice, you're going to go, you know what, I can wear these to the restaurant. Pair of flip-flops, collared shirt, untucked. Bro, trust me. Go to birddogs.com and use the promo code BERT and get your free bird dog whistle tip football with your pair of bird dogs. You're not going to take them off, I promise. Like, how tied in were you to the comments and to the reactions of the videos you were posting? Because some of them, it was interesting. Uh, the, the Neistat Productions, I, I won't say Casey Neistat, because I think Casey Neistat, for me, was the guy in the videos. But Neistat Productions would be you snowboarding through New York. Yeah, yeah. Where, like, I would watch you do something, I go, that's a badass idea. And And don't ever think, for a fucking second, anyone listening to this, that every one of my, whatever viral video I've had, uh, where I was me dancing in a speedo, or or uh, what, whichever ones I've put out, me hiring a marching band, they weren't directly inspired from the way you were looking at life, and 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 I mean just the littlest things like I I didn't feel like you were rich, but I felt like you go, it's okay to throw money at an idea and make an idea cool and have fun making a cool idea. So, like, for me, one time I, I hired a marching band to come play oh, at my I'm house. I'm familiar with that. Yeah, and I go, but it's completely because of uh, just being ingrained into the way you were seeing the world in art and then going, oh, I can welcome that into my my world and I'll do that. And 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 so, like, when you do, like, the the, the snowboarding videos, I mean, they go viral everywhere. They're, they're fucking it's, everywhere. It's, that snowboarding, thank you for saying that, by the way. It means a lot, but... Like snowboarding in New York City, that one video, for example, like five years before I released that video where I'm in the red jacket flying around the city, I did a version of that where it snowed out and I went and snowboarded around behind a friend's pickup truck and like the video did well and like people yeah. got a lot of attention. And at that moment, I was like, this is going to happen again. I'm going to do this right. And I literally, I bought a Jeep with huge trucks, I, with huge wheels. I bought chains for those wheels. I had it parked in an elevated garage. So no matter how much snow happened, I could get out. I did all of this testing because I had to be able to drive. There had to be enough snow so the NYPD couldn't drive, but I could. Like all of these things. 
Two years in a row, we were supposed to get these huge snowstorms. I had an entire crew, my crew, sleep in a hotel so we'd all be together the night before. Not enough snow. And like that's how much premeditation went into that one video. And when I woke up that morning and there were 26 inches, I was like, let's fucking go. And like in addition to all of the shit that you could see that was visible, we burned through about $50,000 with the camera gear because like we'd be shooting with a gimbal, boom, drop it, breaks, run it over, pull the memory card out, trash it, next piece of equipment, go. Like four drones lost because there were 40 mile an hour winds. It's a blizzard. Yeah. Did we get the shot? No, go get another one. Get it, got the shot, trash it, take the card, go. Like over and over and over. And that video is two and a half minutes long. We started shooting at 7 a.m. We finished the last final shot. It's getting dark outside just to get those perfect shots. Wow. Like that video was so incredibly calculated because it was like a fantasy. I was like, this never happens. Like this could be the one moment. And that video to me is still this high watermark because there was a Rangers game the next night. And that video came up on the, um, they played it on the Jumbotron in Madison Are Square Garden. Serious? Yes. And the minute the video came up, the crowd burst into applause. Like they're all like the cell phone videos of it. People were just sending them to me. And I was like, fuck, that is it. Oh. That is it. That was a, that was a big, that was a big one. I mean, that was like, uh, oh, and then, and then what was fun about the way you worked was you, you'd see the viral video and then you were like, oh, tomorrow I get to see the making of the viral video. Right. And then the day after I get to see the reaction of the making of the, vi like it was, it was such a fun. And I, and I really, honestly, I started looking at, at, at life in those, through those lenses. It's one of the things that I don't think people understand enough. Um, I had a guy, uh, I didn't mean for it to be go bad, but this guy tweeted me, said, I ate, I lost a tooth, <laughs> lost a tooth <laughs> and I had, and I had oatmeal on a podcast with Segura and, uh, the guy goes, this is why I don't listen to this shit podcast. Um, there's so many podcasts where they have great production value for the record. Two bears, one cave is the highest production value you're going to find in any podcast out there right now. It's Tom in much like you, and I want to get you and Tom together. Because your brains work yeah, I'm, well. I'm a huge fan of yeah, well. yeah. And so, but much like you, Tom is a guy who goes, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. And let's let's make sure, like Tom was the first guy I knew that got a studio. And, but anyway, my point is I, I I just tweeted to the guy, you listen to one of our 100 episodes where I ate. I have only eaten once on a podcast, on this podcast. And you stopped listening? I was like, I ate once. And I ate half a bowl of oatmeal. And it was a bit. And then he got... He got shit on by everyone. And, and, and then my reaction was, man, I, I don't think enough people, you learn so much out of liking something. Mm. Like when you hate something, and there's a lot to be learned about. Like I, I witnessed some people ruin their careers, you know, on pussy and drugs and alcohol. And I, I watched that happen and, and I didn't enjoy watching it happen. And I learned a lot, but I learned so much by being a fan of yours. I learned so much by and there's no there's no I, there's no way to explain to people if if you don't and, and i'm saying this to the listener if you're if you're listening and you're going i don't know what that feels like to be excited to go look at someone's videos then it's like you're missing out on something because there's a whole world of ideas out there and there are dudes doing ideas doing great ideas like you, you, what did you paddleboard across the fucking East river? You had drones fly you on in air. Like you did you, these high water stunts were so fun to watch you do that. I go, Oh, that, then I'm, in my head, I go, Oh yeah, I bet we can, I bet. You know what? Like, come on, Bert, you're not maybe willing to snowboard behind a, what you call it, but what can you do that's bigger and fun to announce a tour, you know, to get eyeballs on it. It, Your um, Dancing in a Speedo video, by the way, when you released that on Instagram, I had never saved a video on Instagram before. <laughs> and I didn't know how. And I saw that post and it was so fucking good that I like Googled how to save video on Instagram. Since so before they had the save flag. And I did it and then like saved that video so I could like go home and show it to Candace. It was so, it was so fucking good. You have no idea what a tremendous compliment that is, is that, right? I, that I will never forget. I I remember uh, that that means a great deal. And then what I mean, the, the best payback is is Segura, of course, then spending forty five thousand dollars to shoot a music video to compete with it. I mean, like the but the fun of it, it's like th there's there's a there's something about you that 
there's very childlike that that you go, this should be fun. I mean, it's not fun. I don't want to do it. Yeah, you know, I've always said like my mission in life, and I'm 40 in like a week. Talk about like that is just a punch in the stomach. I know you're old enough, but it is a fucking punch (laughs) in the stomach. Yeah. Um, but like my mission in life, and it's so it's as vivid now as it was then, but like when I was a little kid, I always felt like I was kind of being put down. And I can tell you now in retrospect, it's because I was. Like I, it was a very traditional neighborhood that I grew up in. It was a shitty public school with teachers that just didn't want to put up with someone that was like me. And I don't blame them for that. I was a fucking pain in the ass. But like, I was always told I was wrong and no. And then the people in leadership positions, like Mr. Alexopoulos, you're, I know you're still alive, you motherfucker, because I looked it up. <laughs> and like, he was my principal. He's a fucking awful person. <laughs> And I remember him like screaming at me with this terrible fucking principal breath being like, you're either going to be working at a gas station or you're going to be in jail. Like you don't tell a fucking 11 year old that. that. You don't. And like, that's what he did. And he, these were the leaders. In my, and I remember then like establishing this goal in my life that was so vivid and the goal was singular. And that was that when I get older, I'm going to realize all the promises I'm making to myself now as a kid. And that is something I hold true to today. Like, I just want to realize the promises I made to myself as a kid. And I think that 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 vlog, like those 800 episodes, that's what that was. It was sort of an embodiment of that. Like, that vlog was only limited by my imagination. That's the most beautiful way to make art. Like, yeah, that that episode where I flew underneath a drone over a mountain, which, by the way, like, that drone cost millions to make. We had those, like, the (laughs) propellers for that were hand-shaped carbon fiber in Austria. Like, no human had ever been flown under a drone before. That drone had 2,000 feet of vertical lift. And the original idea was I wanted to fly over an island. I was going to wakeboard behind that thing and then have it lift me over an island. Not one island country in the world would give us permission to do it. No one. Really? I mean, the ones we looked into, like nowhere in the Bahamas, nowhere like Belize said no. Everywhere said no. And I was like, let's see if we can find a mountain. United States, North America, everyone said no. And the Finnish head of aviation or whatever it was was like, yes, we think we can accommodate you. So that's why we shot that in fucking Finland. And we were still like, we made a deal with the government. We wouldn't fly more than 20 feet off the ground. And that's why in the final shot for that video, when I'm flying over a mountain and we're like 300 feet in the air, it was the last shot of the whole production. Yeah. But it was like only limited by my imagination. And that's what that video was. Um, And I think the like, maybe it's just not as interesting to talk about, but it's so, this was like two years ago. But when I'm thinking about all of this and like all these experiences that we're talking about, the show, everything, it feels like such a distant past for me because of how far in the opposite direction I've since swung. Yeah, how did you get to that? I want to get, what, what, we've been going for an hour. What's your time? What time do you need I mean, to get out I, here? I can, I, like, as long as I could leave by like 5.30, I'm probably perfect, okay. Perfect, perfect. So then what was the transition then? Because I do remember when you stopped posting vlogs. And 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 w- was that CNN? Was that when you started working yeah, with CNN? Yeah, like, so, you know, CNN bought my tech company to so we could build a big company together. That company didn't work. They kind of like, fired my my partner matt and i a year later and tried to you know decide to run it themselves god bless them great people that i worked at cnn no hard feelings there it just didn't work out and i remember that as soon as they fired us i talked to my business partner matt and i was like matt what are you gonna do and he's like i'm taking a year or two off and i'm gonna travel and figure out what i'm gonna do next and i was like cool bro i'm starting another company tomorrow <laughs> and it was a huge fucking mistake it was a yeah. huge mistake And a big part of the reason for us moving out here was like, there's no way I can turn off this go mentality so long as I'm in New York City. Was was this company the podcast? Yeah, it was called 368. And it was like, it was a podcasting company. It was a video production company. It was an advertising agency. I got so excited for that. In in fairness, we did really well. The company did really well until I was so burnt out. I couldn't like show up. I couldn't function. Yeah. Um, I, I couldn't operate. And that's why I was like, we have to get out of New York City. And I came out here and it's like, when I say I do fuck all right now, like I mean that. And the craziest thing is like how present I am with my children right now. Like it's one thing, like even when I was vlogging, I was still spending hours a day with my baby Franny then when she was just born. My brain wasn't there. I'd be tickling her and she'd be laughing. We'd watch fucking Peppa Pig together and I'd be thinking about my vlog. Like, you know, today, like my daughter, like came from school, had donuts, like we're hanging out. I'm just there with her. It's just us. Yeah. This morning we're on our way to school. We're a little bit early. I'm like, let's go get McDonald's. It's just us. We're so focused. 
Like tonight, Candace is with her mom. Like it's just me and the girls. Like my brain, my everything is just there. I've got nothing else to think about but being present like with those kids, being present with my wife. And like what, you talk about being the luckiest guy in the world. Who gets to do that? Uh, not my dad's a lot of people. 70 right now. He's never gotten that. He just yeah. retired. He still doesn't get to do that. Like I'm completely present in whatever bullshit I'm doing, whether it's like surfing, coming out here to be on your fucking podcast, <laughs> hanging out with my kids. Like I'm just completely present and there's no stress and there's no distractions. And I don't know how long I'll be able to sustain this before I get bored and that like heroin-like addiction to run back at being a workaholic will return. But like I'm really appreciative of how extraordinary this moment is to effectively be ret a retired guy at age 39 with a two-year-old and a six-year-old at home in a marriage that's like a solid B plus, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'll take a solid B plus any day of the week. <laughs> oh yeah, B plus, B, B plus puts you in like the 1% of all marriages. Oh yeah, that w was the, I, I, I had reservations about you guys moving to LA. It was weird. It's not going to work out. I, no, I just was like. No, I'm very, I'm totally serious. What? We're not going to last what? in LA. Yeah. The marriage will sustain. But yeah. I, I give us another year tops. Yeah. I'm curious. Cause I, I was like, I was like, he's so New York. I'm like, so New York. You are like, you we are. We miss it. We miss it. We talk about it every day. If it wasn't really? for the fucking pandemic, we would have already moved back. Yeah. You think? Yeah, I know. So what, what was it like? What was the culture shift like when you came out here? Did you guys move to the beach? We moved to the beach. We still live at the beach. Um, at least so, so it's so it it I, and I love LA. I love. I'll never yeah, leave. It's a great place. I love LA, but I'm also very not New York. Um, so we moved out here because of family. My brother Van lives here. He has a little boy. Um, my sister lives here. My my younger brother works here. He's here a lot. Um, Candace's sister, their family's here. Candace's parents are here. So that's a pretty big magnet. Yeah, that's a pretty big magnet. And then we, I just had to get the, I had to get out of New York or I was going to lose my mind. And so that's why we came here. And I think immediately, like right off the boat, it felt great. Like it felt special because we moved in this house that was great. We lived at the beach. We had never lived in a house before. I'd never like had a car that I could actually drive, um, go surfing every day. All this like fucking weed is legal here. And I wasn't working. So I just smoked pot every day. Like <laughs> there was like all this new stuff that was really exciting. Yeah. And it started to fade probably like, six months later. Yeah. Like it stopped feeling exciting. And there's something about New York City, like not to sound obnoxious, but there's like a pulse, there's a camaraderie, there's like a, there's a, an intangible in that city that is does not exist here. And I think Candace and I are both confronted with how vital that is to our being, our personalities, our existence. And then the pandemic hit and like, thank God we were out here. Like, fuck. Yeah. Oh my God. We have a yard or we have a swing set in our backyard. Like we were if we were in New York, I don't know, we would have lost it. But now like the, that sort of, we can finally see the horizon of that pandemic. It's really, we're really struggling out here. And I feel like, and I, and I feel like, uh, I feel like where New York now is right now is so you. Oh like my God. The fact that it's like all of a sudden it's back to the seventies and it's like a, like the white walkers around. But I go, Bert, I feel like I've abandoned the city. Like I should be, <laughs> like when it's like New York needs help, like New York's coming back. I'm like, fuck, I should be bringing that city. But like, I should yeah. be there. <laughs> you should be there. I wish I were there. Like, and so I, I think it's only a matter of time. And like, you know, like Candace's parents have a house in South Africa that we go to a lot in the winter. And, you know, in the summer, like, you know, we, we, traveling we're out and about so it's like i think that we'll be able to go back to new york at some point in time and have a different relationship with the city from what we had before i think we needed this hard reset and the hard reset couldn't happen in new york we had to get out and la has served us really well yeah there's what, something there's something about the fucking people here though it's uh you know i'll tell you what it is um tell me in, in my opinion Bert, they don't say hi to me when i say hi on my runs yeah when i go by someone and i say morning they divert their eye contact yeah. New Yorkers don't do that. No. Nah. They say hi. New York, uh, when I, I was taken off, I was caught off guard when I first moved to New York on how friendly people were. Like how, on like how, like, I was like, wow, this is, and then, and then if you walk through Washington Square Park, I was like, I was like, oh, you don't, don't have to be friendly to everyone, Bert. You can just <laughs> keep walking. But yeah, it's New York. LA is kind of, LA is a, a city without an identity. And, and it, 
You know, I, I love it. My kids live, my kids live here. There's a lot to love. I, I live here, Angeles. but I, you know, I watch, you know, Tom's moving to Austin and I'll be spending a week in Austin every month. And, uh, and I, and I, part of me is like, I don't know, do I get a fucking, do I get a house in Austin? And, and it's all we talk about my wife and I, you know, it's like, somebody said this to me. And I think this is a really awesome. Will you grab me a cup of ice if you can? Sorry, keep going. Somebody said this to me. I think it's a really great way to sort of describe it. It's like New Yorkers are really fucking hard on the outside, but on the inside, they're nice, generous people. Yeah. And in Los Angeles, it's it's the opposite, where everybody on the outside is very smiling and oh, and it's and it's bullshit. Perfect. And then they're they're kind of cold. And like we've experienced that in a way, especially like with our kids' education and school and trying to reach out to other parents and like build relationships. And it's just like it's so alienating and strange. People in our neighborhood, like ice is right there underneath that black cup. There's an ice machine. So that part we're struggling with. I don't mean to shit on. No, no, no. Else. There's I, look, good there's, people there's here. A, We've met stuff great we can, people here. I, I'll, I, I, a, a good example is like when you see Bentleys driving by homeless encampments, and it's like, or, or like when we we talk about among our friends, like we moved already from Venice to a different part of town because like there was a lot of violence in our neighborhood yeah and to be like totally totally transparent there was like an inflection point where like our babysitter was walking our at the time one-year-old and our five-year-old in a dual stroller and there was just like a homeless guy standing there jacking off and like the babies didn't see it thank god but like for a five-year-old girl to see that that can affect them for the rest of their lives and like as parents it's our job to protect them from that oh yeah and and you know what's interesting is there when you say bentley is driving by homeless encampments it's interesting because New York doesn't it there there is a uh, Bruce Wayne ness about New York sometimes where you see people getting into stretch limousines or whatever out of a premiere but but it is so apparent and and in L A um, the homeless pro problem has been heartbreaking to me like I just I don't I don't have a solution for it and I want to fix it but I I don't know what to do and I and I think that that's I think that that's true and I, I don't you know like I, I, I think it's unfair to offer criticism unless you have solutions. I, I don't have any solutions. But, <laughs> I got no solutions. So, I, so I'm not I'm not criticizing the whole situation. What I'm criticizing is that when we started to talk among people we knew about, like you know, there's like a guy jacking off in the street and there are two shootings on our block last week. We need to move. The answer is like, oh, you know what? Go to the Palisades. There's none of that there. And it's like, so like I got to move to like this rich, fancy neighborhood to avoid the reality of this city. And just like you said, like New York City has its problems, a lot of them, including homelessness and crime, a lot of the yeah. same issues you deal with here. But there's a certain sense of homogeny there. It's like you sit on the subway and the guy to your right is like a, a waiter and the woman to your left is like a fucking hedge fund manager. Yeah. But you're sitting on the subway together because it's the fastest way to get to from 96th Street to Wall Street. Just is what it is. You're all in this together. Like all that like September 11th, New York City strong shit, like that is real. Yeah, there, that city is an identity. Like you are in it, you are in it together. Like, like whether you are dirt poor or like you're the fanciest guy, the fastest way to get around town is the same dirty ass two dollar and twenty five cent subway ride. Like it's, it is this unifying thing where you feel a sense of belonging. You feel like you're all part of it together. And Los Angeles really feels like um, a city in name only. Yeah, and no. That wears on us. I, I want to talk to you. Uh, well, I'm going to get you out of here soon. But I, the two things I want to talk to you about are running and YouTube creators now. Like yeah. the guys that are blowing up now, the guys that are killing it. Um, uh, because I'm, I'm curious what happens to this generation of YouTube guys. So it, it feels like you're still very much in it, but it feels like you're you're. It feels like you have so many opportunities on your horizon of. It really feels like sky's the limit for you that you are achieving everything that they're trying to get to but you've also been through this race that they're going into i'm curious what you think about them you know i the world of youtube has really changed like i think that i was in it at a time when the youtube creator had a certain identity within youtube that was well defined and youtube did everything it could to bolster that identity and that means that like, whether you're a technology YouTuber, like my, my friend Marquez Brownlee, who's a brilliant YouTuber, you were like a lifestyle vlogger like I was, or like you're somebody who make videos about cars. You're sort of one of the same group of YouTube creators. And I feel like that has really gone away. And I don't know if there's anyone to sort of fault that for happening or it's just an organic part of the evolution of YouTube. But I feel like the YouTube 
culture has never been, is, is fragmented now in a way that it never was when I was really in it. Like, I don't know who, who is YouTube right now. M Mr. Beast, yes, he's sort of an anomaly. He's amazing. And, he, and I don't even know who Mr. Mr. Beast is. is the biggest YouTuber to ever exist. For real. Without a question. God damn it. Where the fuck Every am I? video he posts does. I was going to say Logan Paul. 20, 40, 60. <laughs> Logan's doing. Logan is. I, I'm fascinated I, by I the love Paul Logan. Brothers. Like, I'm fascinated by those two guys. Um, Lo Logan's a friend. He's doing great things. And like, you know, Logan had a sort of a, a, a dark spot in his space. Like, he fucked up. Logan fucked up in his. When he was coming up on YouTube. And I think he's done an amazing job of kind of correcting that. Like he's really built a career for himself. I'm really could excited. Could you see that? Could you see that? Yeah. In in taking that path, could you see go you, you when you when when he slipped up, could you go, oh I I I I recognize yeah. that behavior. Yeah. I was I've been there where it's, you're like, thank God I didn't upload that or whatever. Yeah, it, it's 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 a formula. It's a pursuit of sensationalism sensationalism is rewarded by more views and more attention. So great, more sensationalism, more views, more attention. Yeah. You keep following that, there's an inevitable conclusion, which is you're going to cross a line. Yeah. And I, I, I think that like there are, there are arguably moments where I came very close to that or, or something, but I also think that I, I was deliberate in avoiding that. But I think in Logan's case, like he, he crossed that line and had his ass kicked so bad. He really got the fuck beaten out of the him. Fuck. And, and look, I'm, I, I'm not going to defend his actions. I think that he is deserving of the ass beating he got. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he slipped up. He did something fucking awful and he paid the price for it. And where I give Logan so much credit for is, is he, he, he has since taken ownership of that. Yeah. He's worked hard to address that Dude. and he's built himself a new career. And like, I'm a big fan of Logan Paul. I, I, I love, love what he does. I love his podcast. Personally, he and I talk offline all the time. Like I really, I, I root for Logan. I want to see him win. Um, but we were talking about YouTube and its identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I, I don't know what it is right now. And I think that there's a negative to that, which is like, it's a bummer because it used to be cute when YouTube had this sect of creators that you'd really identify the platform. But I also think there's something virtuous there and that like this fragmentation means that like, you can be a mom in the Midwest who does baking videos once a week that do 20,000 views and build a career off of that. Yeah. And like, as it becomes more and more fragmented, the opportunities become more and more dynamic and that's really special. So you're losing something in its identity, but you're getting something in that like, the opportunities to succeed there, I feel like are more ubiquitous now than they've ever been before. Wow. Running. Running. So- you, you 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 had a knee problem, right? A degenerative knee problem? No, I've got all my right leg is made out of metal. From the knee up is all titanium here, a motorcycle accident. Okay. And then I've got a meniscus that's torn on the other side because it takes all the burdens. So I've got a metal leg. Yeah. And then I just cracked my right heel a month and a half ago, so I'm always broken. Yeah. But running is like the constant in my life. I, I did eight miles a day before I came here. And it's only because I'm recovering. Otherwise, it'd be a 16-mile day. So every day is a 16-mile day. Because 13 was like your your go-to. When you were doing the vlog, you were 12, 13 yeah, almost every day. like a dozen is sort of like my buy-in. Like I'm not, if I can't do a dozen, I'm not going to go out. Yeah. And I go out every day. But like running is my favorite thing. It's one of the only, like I said, surfing. You're sitting out in the middle of the ocean and you're like, this is just for me. Running is to me so meditative. Like my once I start going, body just turns off. No thinking, no nothing. I don't get tired. I don't get winded. I don't get sore. Like none of that. I'm just a, my body is completely in cruise control. Like if you've ever used autopilot on a Tesla, where you're just like, whoa, it's doing it itself. Like that's what happens to my body. So yeah. then it's just like I can listen to music and think about ideas, or I can like listen to podcasts and think about other people talk about ideas. I can listen to books on tape and learn, which is like my favorite thing. But otherwise, I'm just out in nature. I can't run on treadmills. I, I only can run on treadmills. Is that right? Yeah, I get on treadmills, but I, I like I, my running is different. I so I think because I party, I like to, I like to really push it the next day because I know that if I if I get my heart rate up to like 168 and really really kind of punish myself, then all the hangover goes away and I feel amazing. I feel amazing. So uh, what I like to do is I like to jog. Uh, I, six miles is my, five miles is my, I have to do five miles a day. And so I actually- on a treadmill. On a treadmill. So I do three mile jog, soft jog, watching uh, something from Ken Burns or something on Food Network. And then I do, I love doing uh, fart licks. Like 
sprints, jogs, sprints. Jog. I love for whatever reason, a, a sprint is the thing that cleans me out. Yeah. For so sure. like I can't I can't just sit and go for a run. But you but I gotta be honest with you, in, in all fairness, your probably average pace of a mile is what I'm sprinting at. Like you what do you do? Run like seven minute miles? Yeah, I'm a little slower now, but yeah. 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 My 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 sprints are are probably what your probably pace is. I'm guessing. I don't know. My I'm just I'm a little fucking fat. So and I'm always hung over if I'm running and I'm I always yeah, I, I I love it. I love it. And then like, I got really injured a year ago or something like that. Like, broke, shattered my shoulder. And oh yeah, that's really, right. Like, it's really fucked up. And it was the longest window of time when I wasn't running. And I was also like smoking a lot of pox. It was right when I moved here. Like, yeah. Weed was new. Um, I got really bored of that. I stopped smoking weed. But like, so I like got really out of shape. And like, I didn't get fat. Like, I probably put on ten pounds. But it was like in putting on ten pounds, I like lost all that fitness. And I just remember there were like a couple moments like sprinting up the steps and I was like, what's happening? I was like, I'm having a heart attack. I'm going to die. And all it was, was like me being winded because I just went up a flight of steps. But that feeling is so foreign to me. It's It it, it feels amazing. And I, I can say this personally right now, and I'm overweight, but to, to be in shape, I'm in great shape right now. I'm in the best shape of my life. Not physically, I don't look it, but man, I'm fucking, I'm like doing two a days every day. I run five and a half miles. And I'm lifting weights with a trainer and I'm loving it. But there's a powerful feeling when you walk up a flight of stairs and you, you feel the power it. in your legs just take you up those stairs and you go, these are kind of like lunges. And then you lower yourself a little bit. And you're like, I'm feeling the muscle in my glute. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I was like, I don't want to throw anybody into the best bus, but like I, I was at a, a shoot this week for a friend. Yeah. And you park your car and then you'd go up. And it was like way at the top of the mountain was where the set was. The only way to get there was to walk. And I was carrying gear for a friend and I was on the phone. And I'm sprinting up like as fast as I can because I'm late and I'm getting yeah. And I stopped because the woman behind me, like my handler had stopped. And I turned around and I was like, like, am I doing something? She's like, I just need a break. And like, she, God bless her lovely woman. She just need a break. I think most people would need a break. Yeah. But it only occurred to me then that like the superpower you get by being in shape, like you talk about getting your heart rate up to 165 beats. Per, I'm incapable of getting it that high. Oh yeah. At a seven minute mile, my heart rate's barely breaking a hundred. No. Like I can keep it that low. For real? I mean, not the first seven minute mile, okay. but by like mile five or six, yeah. absolutely. If it's flat, I can lower the heart rate. Like just- It's funny. I looked at my heart rate for the LA marathon and it was at like 111 for the whole race. And I went, that seems, I thought it would have been higher. No, the first one, like when you first start going, it's like when I used to be really big into racing, I would always do like, if it was a short race, a 5k, a 10k, I'd always sprint a mile or two first or jog a mile to get that like initial, like explosion of, of your heart rate out. And then when you start, you're sort of at that cruise control place. But yeah, now like my heart rate is like, like my resting heart rate is like 40, sometimes lower than 40. Segura's fucking resting heart rate's 40. Yeah, he's heart, like, like, he's I, like to the point where the doctors get concerned. They, they worry, like, listen, and then they're like, something's wrong with the stethoscope. And they listen again. It's like the same heart rate as a fucking elephant. It's like, boof, boof, and then a break. And boof, boof. And it is such a good feel, especially as I'm getting older. Like this, all I want is to be able to hang on to this. Yeah. Yeah. My whole goal is to be, I just, I, I go, this is the last run you have at getting in shape. Like if this is where I'm at right now. You either do it or you don't. And if you don't, then all of a sudden you're sitting on a toilet at 56 going, honey, I'm stuck. And I was like, that's not going to, never going to happen to me. But uh, I got to tell you, man, thank you so much for doing this. This is great. I've, I've, this is the perfect first indoor. It's not a lot of razzle dazzle, but the conversation it's been, I've been wanting to do this for the, since 2015. And you know, it was raining out when I got here and it was like a sunny, it's beautiful, right? Now. Beautiful day right now. And I think that that is like a bit of a, that's like the world shining down on us. Hey, May some of my luck go on to you and better <laughs> things happen. It. I'll take it. Thanks for doing this, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was fun.